give me the okay and we'll go ahead and get started. Yes. Oh, Deb, did you? Okay. Yeah, sure. It's rolling. Welcome, everyone. Hopefully, we'll have some more stragglers once they get through traffic. I'm glad you were able to join us tonight for this presentation. This topic of EMF safety is very important and one of growing importance. First, I would like to thank Forrest. Where did she go? She left. And uh, Karen Crusell and Dorothy Baker for organizing this event and reaching out to the community leaders and our mass legislators to be here tonight. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker tonight, my colleague and friend, Cecilia Doucette, joining us from Ashland, Mass. I would like to share a little bit of background about CC. CC spent eight years fundraising to bring wireless technology into her schools. Then she learned it was harmful, which led her into doing an investigation into the non-industry funded science. Then she helped her children's schools become the first in the nation to take precautionary measures with wireless technology. CC also helped her public school library become the first in the nation to loan out a radiation detection meter and to host a documentary film and discussion series on electromagnetic radiation and health. She established the Massachusetts for Safe Technology to bring citizens together on this vital issue and works with schools, communities, municipalities, and legislators to address wireless radiation and public health. She is also the Educational Services Director with international nonprofit wireless education, which offers affordable 30-minute online training for schools, families, and corporate safety induction. I pulled this right from CC's biography. <laughs> CC was honored to co-chair the technology panel for the Health and Buildings Roundtable Conference at the National Institutes of Health, and to present state and local policy at the International EMF Medical Conference. She has been featured on Boston 25 News, PBS, O'Dwyer, CHD TV, Spirit of Change, EMF Warriors, and in the films Generations Apt and Wi-Fi Refugees. Now I'd like to just add a note of my own gratitude. As someone with EMF sensitivity, also called EHS, I have been attending CC's monthly Zoom meetings of the Mass for Safe Tech for a few years now. And at her invitation, I have testified in support of wireless safety bills at the Massachusetts and the New Hampshire State Houses. And I would just like to say, I'm giving myself goosebumps here, CC is one of the most gracious, professional, responsive, hardworking, knowledgeable, persistent, and tireless people I have had the pleasure of working alongside. While facing this serious and growing issue of wireless harm and the need for safer solutions, an issue which requires grace under fire, which requires persistence and a need to stay the course while the telecom industry continues to ignore our pleas, there is no one I am more grateful to have on our team than this very special woman. Please welcome Cece Doucette. Okay. Some of your literature with me here. Thank you, Deb. You are very, very welcome. And so that's why I get up every day and keep doing this work, because we get to work with the best people. So my heart out to yours. Thank you, everybody who's tuned in to the wireless radiation issue, took the time to be here tonight, or took the time to watch it through your local cable station. We're very grateful that people are tuning into this issue. So as Deb mentioned, like most of us, I had no idea there was even anything to question with today's wireless technology because it came to market, so it must be fine, right? So I spent eight years bringing this into my kids' schools in Ashland, Massachusetts at the time when the industry was pushing in their 21st century classroom. And you know, good to be parents, our schools didn't have money for all this new equipment, so we stepped in and started doing fundraisers to get wireless infrastructure to get Chromebooks and iPads and minis and smart boards and Apple TV. And what we were being told was all this amazing technology. Then one night at book group, a girlfriend of mine who's an electrical engineer, she and all four of her children have chronic Lyme disease. And Wendy's an engineer, so she goes at things systematically. 
and she was reading a book called Zapped by Anne Louise Gittleman. And she came to us at book group and said, guys, I think there's something wrong with Wi-Fi. And it was book group, so I just kind of made a little mental note of it. But then not long after that, as I was the grant coordinator for our public schools, something else crossed my desk, insinuating the same thing. Now, I'm a technical and professional writer by trade, and so I thought, huh, I wonder if there's anything to this. Is there any science? So that was where I began my investigation, and I was just dumbfounded that you don't even have to look very far to find the science. There's a compendium called the Bioinitiative Report. This is the cover. I'm going to read to you from the table of contents, just so you have an understanding of the categories of biological interference. The actual report is 1,600 pages with summaries of literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies all over the world. So, summary of key scientific evidence. Evidence to damage to sperm and reproduction. And when I started reading those sperm studies, I'm reading that they have taken male human sperm, exposed it to a laptop with the antennas radiating, and it changed the DNA, which is our roadmap to grow a crop or anything, a person or a plant or an animal or a biome. It changes the DNA. It slowed the, mut the motility of male human sperm, and it caused far fewer sperm to be viable in just four hours of exposure to a laptop. And I went, you've got to be kidding me. My oldest had just gone up to St. Mike's with her MacBook, which she, of course, is using right on top of her reproductive organs. My youngest had just gone into high school, and for Christmas, we gave her a laptop, thinking we were giving her a leg up. So when I started reading those reproductive studies, and since then, Kaiser Permanente and others have come out with additional studies showing harm to women's reproduction, showing that babies that are born to women who were using wireless technology are falling down the rabbit hole to ADD, ADHD, autism, and more. Okay, so that, that was actually the set of studies that helped me to find my voice on this issue. Evidence that children are more vulnerable. They're not just little adults. Their DNA is still under construction. Their immune system, their central nervous system are all still being built and this damages DNA. Their skulls are thinner than yours and mine. Their brains have a higher water content than yours and mine. And the reason why that's important is because when we say wireless, what we're talking about is radio frequency microwave radiation that pulses at us day in and day out unless we know to make different choices. So when we have like a microwave oven and we put something in it that has water in it, that water conductivity is what allows it to cook our food. And so here a child's brain has a higher water content and what do we suppose it's doing to that child's brain? Dr. Om Gandhi has done some of the modeling on this. And he puts a cell phone up to a model and tests to see how far into the brain that radiation travels on an adult skull. And for you and I, it's going in about a third of the way through the brain. On a 10-year-old child, it's going about two-thirds of the way into the brain. And on a five-year-old child, it's permeating almost the child's entire brain. So these are not toys. We should never, ever give a child an active device. But we'll talk about solutions, too. So fetal and neonatal effects. I remember at my high school, our athletic trainer was pregnant with twins. And you know, the bump makes a pretty convenient spot to stick a tablet or a cell phone. So I shared that with her, and hopefully her twins are doing um, effects on autism. Dr. Martha Herbert founded the Autism Lab at Mass General Hospital here in our home state. And she sees huge connections between what we know happens with microwave radiation and what she is seeing in the families with autistic family members. We also have um, evidence for electrohypersensitivity, which is what Deb referenced. 
This is something that in the very beginning was called microwave sickness. That's because we developed this technology for our militaries as radar. And it's using microwaves to carry our signals and our data back and forth. Uh, there's a great poster on the wall back there that you're welcome to take a picture of. There's a handout that says the same thing. Do you want me to bring the poster up front? Sir? Sure. And it talks about what are a lot of these symptoms that people are experiencing today, but how would they ever know to think that just by removing their wireless radiation exposures, they might see a significant reduction in headaches, stabbing, searing headaches, migraines, sleep issues are a huge one. In my lifetime, sleep is what children and adolescents did best. And now we have kids who can't sleep anymore. We have adults who don't sleep through the night. And one of the best blessings is that time and again after one of these talks, people say, Cece, I didn't want to know this. I didn't want to believe it. <laughs> Welcome to the club. None of us did. But they'll say, I took a chance and I just turned it all off. And oh my gosh, I slept through the night for the first time or my children's behavior issues have calm way down when they're not getting jacked by microwave radiation all night long. So the science tells us with regard to the sleep issues, in the wee hours of darkness, as part of our circadian rhythm, which is regulated by light, in the wee hours of darkness, the pineal gland in the brain is meant to release melatonin. Melatonin goes in and regulates our sleep. It also helps to escort the toxins of the day out through the bloodstream. So what happens when we leave this invisible, light, man-made energy form pulsating all night? Well, the brain's over there going, hey, when's it going to get dark so I can release melatonin? So that's why we see a lot of people get better quickly when they just shut this stuff off, especially in a sleep sanctuary. Um, concentration, memory, brain fog, fatigue, um, there's another set of scientific studies that show something that's called the Rouleau effect. And in my little brain, the way I remember that one is when I was a kid, I used to love those chocolate caramels called Rolos that were stacked up. So the Rouleau effect makes me think of that, and it's kind of similar. Our red blood cells are meant to be free floating and oxygenating all of our vital organs and all of our systems and cells. This is an electromagnetic man-made field of energy that's causing our blood cells to magnetize, to glom together. And then we see that they're stacking up like a roll of coins, and they can't free float and get to where our bodies need that oxygen. And as the scientists and the doctors will tell us, oxidative stress is one of the precursors for most chronic illnesses that we're seeing skyrocketing today. So, ringing in the ears, the tinnitus, humming, sharp pains, noise sensitivity, these are all classic microwave sickness symptoms. And then our skin has little antennas in the surface of our skin. So what happens when we bombard our skin with microwave radiation? In some people, it turns out to be a rash, or they got the hot ear, or the tingling in the hand, or they hold an active cell phone, um, facial flushing, and then mood, this is a neurotoxin, right? It opens up a sensitive area we have called our brain that has a protective membrane called the blood-brain barrier. Science is showing us that these pulsations of spiked erratic microwave radiation coming at us at millions in the megahertz range and billions of cycles, that's the gigahertz range, a million or a billion cycles per second going win, 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 win. It's permeating the blood-brain barrier. So now where we used to have a protected brain, as the blood is escorting toxins out of the body, guess what? They can turn into these sensitive areas like the brain or permeate the gut barrier. So we know scientifically now what these mechanisms of harm are. And for a long time, the industry got away with saying, oh, just keep doing what we're doing because there's no mechanism of harm identified. Well, that is no longer true. Eyes, pressure, inner behind the eyes, twitching, loss of vision, uh, 
cataracts, and then the heart. Depending on your body's proclivity, it might cause your heart to go too fast or too slow. It can cause arrhythmias, chest pain. I've heard people describe it like somebody sitting on their chest. Difficulty breathing, higher or lower blood pressure than you would want. Other things are adrenal problems, digestive, weight loss, tingling, dehydration, hair loss, flu-like symptoms, and again, the attention and behavioral issues. Um, thank you, Deb, for sharing that with us. And Deb is a graphic artist, and I want to give her a shout out for creating these visuals for well, us. Well, I didn't create the original. But. No, but you made it available to share. Um, thank you to our friends in Michigan who did create that visual for Death and Attack Over at We Are The Evidence. That's a good website to look at, too. So uh, it goes on. Um, brain tumors are increasing because we tend to hold cell phones up to our brains. Our own Senator Ted Kennedy, his family believes that's what caused his glioblastoma. Uh, Bo Biden, same thing. So a lot of famous people at California Brain Tumor Association. Ellie Marks and her son founded that after Ellie's husband developed one of the glioblastomas. He was a realtor. He was on his phone all the time. And then it took a really bad turn. So Ellie has dedicated her life to helping other families with these brain tumors. So cancers, um, when I was first doing my research, this was back in 2014, since then, our own government completed a $30 million study through the U.S. National Toxicology Program. And at the National Toxicology Program, they had an unprecedented three-day peer review at the National Toxicology Program with world-leading experts whose life's work is investigating microwave radiation. At the end of the day, and you can pull this right up on the National Toxicology Program website, they determined clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage along with other findings. Now, clear evidence is the highest of five categories that this most prestigious organization can assign. So one would think that once you classify a $30 million study showing clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage, that the group that commissioned this study would then translate that into public policy. Well, that was our Food and Drug Administration. Fast forward 20 years, there's somebody entirely different in charge. And Dr. Jeffrey Shuren, is that gentleman. And what did he do with this study? He said, oh, we don't really believe that. So he went over to his friends at the Federal Communications Commission and said, don't worry about that. Just keep doing what you're doing. Right? And then the industry, every time a good study comes out and gets anywhere near the media, which they primarily own, they will say, oh, that's just one more study. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. You need more studies. Well, right on the heels of our National Toxicology Program study, finding clear evidence of cancer and DNA damage, the Ramazzini Institute in Italy completed another large study. So this one was done on the handsets, right on the phones. Italy's Ramazzini Institute did it from the cell tower base stations. And guess what? They found the same cancers and DNA damage in Italy as we found here. So we don't need more science. What we need is an informed public to, one, learn how to use technology safely, and two, to lend your voices to say this is not okay. And there are so many good people working on this to help create those opportunities to take easy action. You know, we'll do the heavy lifting, but one voice can easily be swept under the rug. That was my biggest lesson learned when I went to my schools. And you know, I volunteered in my schools and my community for 20 years. I'm little, I'm not physically imposing or scary, right? And when I first raised this with my schools, I thought we would jump on it as if we had a gas leak in the science lab, right? I got back crickets. And Granted, at the time that I raised my hand, it was, it was summertime. And although that's happy time for the kids, it's the busiest season for the school administrators because they're closing out one fiscal year, starting the new budget, doing all their new hires, getting all their materials. And here I am going, um, I think we've got a problem here. 
So nobody responded, but I persisted and I kept sending information and our chairwoman of our school committee is a mother of four children. She's an attorney. She's a yoga instructor. She volunteers at the women's prison and at the hospice center at our hospital. She's just the right kind of good soul. So Lori Tosti and I start sharing materials back and forth. Like I'm sending her that the French National Library took Wi-Fi out in 2008 because of what was being shown in the science back then. So ultimately, we started having this conversation with my schools, and they formed a committee to investigate. We had our former chairwoman of our school committee who knew enough to go look at Washington, D.C. and see who are the top lobbyists of all time. And the top 100 is riddled with telecom, with energy, with technology, all these companies who day to day are up there persuading our legislators to make favorable laws for corporate profit instead of for protecting the public, which is what they're supposed to be doing on our behalf. So what made my schools become the first in the nation to even have this little sign hanging in our classrooms that says, best practices for mobile devices? turn off the devices when not in use. Turn the Wi-Fi on, the routers, the access points, only turn them on when you need them and then turn them right on. And always place the mobile device on a solid surface. Can I see a show of hands if anybody has an iPhone here tonight? Okay, I invite you to take your iPhone out and go into settings. I wanna show you what I think caused our school committee to get at least a little bit on board with some baby steps. So um, if you have signed in on our sign-in sheet, we will send you my slides. I prefer to just look everybody in the eye and talk when I'm presenting in person. But once a month, I do a free public education webinar with friends at New Hampshire for Safe Technology. And I have a built-out set of slides with links to everything. So you'll be able to get at all this information. And on one of those slides, I suggest with an iPhone, you go into settings. And once you're in settings, scroll down just a little bit and hit general. So settings to general. From general, you go all the way down to the bottom to legal and regulatory. And with legal and regulatory, when you hit that, there's a little menu that comes up and about four down, you'll see RF exposure. So it goes settings, general, legal and regulatory, and then RF exposure. And when we take a moment to look at that legal fine print that, by the way, has been in there all along, it's kind of covering the legal backside of the wireless industry, it tells us a couple of really important things. One, this device was tested at a distance from the body. So if you're tucking it in your bra, or your shirt pocket, or your suit pocket, or you're putting it in your waistband, or you're putting it in your back pocket, while it's transmitting, you are exceeding the Federal Communications Commission's public radiation exposure guidelines, which, by the way, were never biologically safety tested. So the FCC allows this much radiation the science that we've been reviewing shows biological harm at hundreds of thousands of times below what the industry is still selling us. So we've got a huge regulatory gap to close. The second paragraph or a subsequent paragraph suggests that you use a hands-free option like speakerphone or a headset. And if you decide to get a headset, you might want to look for something called a hollow tube or an air tube headset. And think of it as kind of like a doctor's stethoscope where you get really good acoustics up to the ear but it's just through a hollow rubber tube because you don't want to put any metal up to your head because radiation really amplifies with metal. So even the ambient radiation will be drawn toward the metal on your head. So you have a nice long wire. You can put your device as far away from you as you can. It has these little ferrite beads that break the radiation that travels up the metal, and then you just have the hollow tube acoustics. 
So you can find a hollow tube or an air tube headset online. There are groups like Less EMF. Um, Jeremy Johnson is a Silicon Valley engineer. He and his wife both got really sick when utility smart meters went in. And so Jeremy does consulting. He can help you figure things out too. Um, so I think when our school saw that legal fine print, I think they had an uh-oh moment because they had issued all of this wireless equipment to our students and our staff with not one shred of safety instruction. So I think that is how Ashland Public Schools in Massachusetts became the first in the nation to even have this little sign hanging up. So one of the things that had me really puzzled when I fell down this rabbit hole back in 2013 is it's invisible. So how do we know that this is really happening? So I learned that there are radio frequency radiation detection meters. And I believe the library has wireless equipment down here. I think that floor is right on the other side of this wall. Oh, that makes sense. So, yeah. so where I'm standing right here, the maximum pulsation of radio frequency microwave radiation is at 1,680. And the unit of measurement is something called a microwatt per square meter. So basically, in three feet of air, how much radiation is this? Well, we're at like 1,700 right now. What does the science want us to be at? The science wants us to be at 10 microwatts or less. So knowing what I know, once I stopped circling my tail and started fixing things that I had control over, I learned that if I just keep my cell phone in airplane mode, and if I go in and I make sure that Bluetooth antenna is off, and I make sure that Wi-Fi antenna is off, along with the cellular data, see Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, hotspot, locator, and for those who didn't know any better and upgraded to a 5G phone, there are additional antennas in there. And who would know that they give us these devices with these separate little antennas in there, constantly going, here I am, where are you? Here I am, where are you? Here I am, where are you? Trying to make a handshake with the nearest cell tower or router. So once we know, cool, we have a choice, right? So my cell phone is always in airplane mode. I only turn it on minimally if I think someone's looking for me and I'll put it over here and I'll let it go, send, receive, and I'll put it right back in airplane mode before I pick it up because my tell is my pinky finger starts to tingle when I hold a radiating device. And ever since I was a kid, I just never felt good under fluorescent lights. That's another man-made form of the electromagnetic field that my body's giving me feedback on. But what happens when I actually take this, when I take this out of airplane mode and it begins to radiate to make that handshake with the nearest cell tower or router? Now, mind you, there's ambient radiation. It could be from the devices of people in the audience, cell phones, tablets, wearables. So without even doing anything, I'm going to put this back in airplane mode to reduce my exposures. And you'll see it's dropping out of the red zone, still a little in the high. But we went from 1,700 to 535,000 microwatts per square meter. And I know when Deb got here, she measured over on that wall. And I think there's a utility closet back there that likely has a lot of the equipment in it. That topped off the meter at two and a half million microwatts per square meter. Right now, we're at a half a million, and we want to be at the little number of 10, one zero. So that's why it's really important for us to tune into this issue, because these sorts of things we have control of, and it's not rocket science to fix. So in your home somewhere, you very likely have a router. Flip the router around and you'll find ethernet ports, little jacks, right? All you have to do is get an ethernet cable and plug it into your router and then run the cable to wherever you use your technology. 
and then you can get uh, something called an Ethernet switch, because most people have more than one device. Like my daughter, when she went down to the University of Delaware and got her first big girl off-campus apartment, she had broken her iPhone and had finally learned to get the insurance for it. And she contacted me and said, Mom, they're going to send me a replacement, but they're going to send it home to Ashland instead of down to Delaware. When it gets there, will you please send it to me? And I thought, little opportunity for mommy blackmail, right? <laughs> and I said, absolutely, if you promise to hardwire your apartment. My husband's over the one, you're me. Um, I said, look, she's 19 years old. She's already had a hunk of skin cancer removed from her back. Anybody with an existing health compromise is especially vulnerable to microwave radiation, as are children, as we discussed. The elderly, because our cognitive abilities begin to slip a little, and this exacerbates that. And anybody with an existing health condition, or a pregnant woman, or a fetus, so we, we really need to get on this and be vigilant. So for Julia, I went online, I ordered a 50-foot Ethernet cable, and then I ordered her an Ethernet switch, which is like an extension cord for electronics. And then I got her little cables, one for her iPhone and one for her MacBook. Who knew? You can buy this little, like, $30 lightning adapter for an iPhone and then just plug it in. And anything you do on the internet, guess what? You can do it safely once you plug it in and then turn off the antennas <coughs> in the router and turn off the antennas in your devices. Same thing for Chromebooks, iPads. You can get the Thunderbolt adapter or the equivalent for whatever platform you happen to have. So it's not rocket science to fix. So once I stopped circling my tail and I thought, okay, I'm the mom, it's my job, I gotta keep my family safe, my daughter's nosebleeds and headaches all but disappeared when she wasn't getting jacked with microwave radiation 24 seven. It's still in Ashland Public Schools. They have this sign, I think, to cover their legal backside but they have not protected the students. They're waiting for higher authorities to tell them what to do. So once I figured that part out, I went to my state senator, who is now our Senate president, Karen Spilka, and Karen and I had served together on the local Ashland Education Foundation board, and we actually brought this technology into our schools. And so, I met her for office hours, and I showed her the science, I showed her Ashland's little sign, I measured her cell phone and her district director's laptop, and both devices, as expected, went right off the charts, and they're looking at me like, really? And I said, yes, and nobody knows. I said, is there something from where you sit that we could at least give the public the right to know, like we ultimately did with smoking, with alcohol, with tobacco, with gambling, with pornography. Adults can make their choices, but they at least deserve the information, and we are morally obliged to protect our children. And by the way, it's not just us. As I mentioned, it's every bird, every bee, every plant, every biome. We all have these whispers in our cells that connect electrically, and we are way <laughs> disrupting. So remember when I was throwing out those big numbers like megahertz and gigahertz and millions and billions of cycles per second? Well, does anybody know what the Earth's electromagnetic field pulses at? Any guesses? It's called Schumann's resonance. 400 is a great guess. Hertz. Yeah, it's actually 7.83. So here, our little birds, our little bees, our pollinators, and everything else. And whales. And yet, yeah, whales in the ocean, everything is trucking along happily to the Earth's resonance. And here we have just pushed out this electro pollution at literally millions and billions of times greater than what their navigation systems are meant to be in sync with the Earth with. So why do we have bee colony collapse? Absolutely, we have to get rid of the neonicotinoids, right? And all the other chemicals we've allowed in. 
But when you pulse this microwave radiation and a little insect's cruising along trying to get back to where it goes, it's lost its signal to the Earth. In The Hague in the Netherlands, when they started testing 5G, which is fifth generation technology, birds are cruising along, they turn on 5G, the birds go boom. Hundreds dropped out of the sky, stunned or dead, when they tested 5G. What frequencies are in 5G? <laughs> it's all the same ones, the long carrier waves and data waves that we had with 3G and 4G, they're still using those. All that's left to monetize are these dinky little waves called millimeter waves, teeny tinies, that are, guess what, the same size as who? Our poor little insects. So now we've got all this existing electropollution, and now they're saying, we're gonna make money off of 5G, right? Faster speeds, faster downloads, super highways, smart cities. Well, that all sounds very cool, doesn't it? Until you do a little research and you find out that these teeny tiny waves, although they can carry vast quantities of data, they can't carry it very far. So what does the industry propose? In order to connect with your newfangled 5G devices, they want to put a cell tower every two to 12 houses inside your neighborhood in our public access way at the curb right outside people's bedroom windows. That's what 5G is. And like I said, you can hardwire the technology that you choose to buy. You can use that safely by turning off the wireless antennas and getting a solid connection through a wire. And guess what? 5G is, or wireless in general, is crummy technology. It's unreliable. It's slow. It throws your data out there to float around through the air for anybody with a $100 application at the curb to snag your data. Data, security, sustainability, green. Back in 2012, a Greenpeace analyst said, if the cloud were a country, it would be the fifth largest consumer of energy in the world. And that was over a decade ago, and look what we've brought into our world since then. So if we're going to get serious about climate change, we have got to do the right thing. Stop with this wireless build-out. Use it secondarily. The retired president of Microsoft Canada is all over this safety issue now. He talked to a dozen of the world's leading doctors and scientists. And now Frank Clegg says, wireless is no longer advanced technology. Fiber optics to the premises. Don't just put it down the middle of your road because then they're gonna put these small cell antennas on top of it and you're gonna wind up with a cell tower in your front or your backyard. So there are many people all over the country now working on this, working with their towns to have safe, responsible technology. So nobody's going to take your toys away. Nobody's saying don't use technology. We love it, we live by it, but it's high time we be given the facts to know that it is extraordinarily toxic. And there are so much better solutions, just hardwire when you're not on the go, right? The one thing we lose is convenience, because I suppose you could run an ethernet cable into the bathroom. That's where a lot of people get up and start their day, right? Um, probably not the best choice. But we can fix everything, but we have to get the information out there and we have to get the education out there. Um, so there are solutions at every turn. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the schools, though, because that's where my journey began helping my schools become the first in the nation to even take precautionary measures. And as I mentioned, for everybody who started late with us, we have a sign-in sheet there. If you put your name and email address very neatly, we'll send you my slides, and then you can just go through and drill down and look deeper into whatever interests you. But this is a graphic that shows the radio frequency radiation exposures in a school with these industrial strength Wi-Fi systems. Look at how many times per second this is jacking our kids. 
This little line down here is a coffee shop. These are industrial strength signals meant to go to hundreds of devices at once through the walls, floors, and ceilings. And that is such a toxic environment for our kids. We do have legislation to get the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to look at it. We have had this legislation for years, and they are waiting for higher authorities to tell them what to do. So, the New York Times did a series of articles that tell us what are Silicon Valley executives doing with their children? They're sending their children to schools with no technology, not hardwired, not wireless, no technology, because they know a child's brain best develops, not in the shallows of a screen, but through meaningful interpersonal interactions with trusted adults, their teachers, their peers, and the natural environment. Silicon Valley executives, as reported in the New York Times, have gone so far as to have their nannies sign contracts that there will be no screens around their children. And yet they push that 21st century classroom in on our kids. So for every bad, there's a good. There's Patty and Doug Wood, who founded Grassroots Environmental Education. They have received an award from the Environmental Protection Agency for the good works they've done on protecting our kids from toxics, like pesticides in the playing fields. Well, Patty and Doug have created a project called Tech Safe Schools. And you can go to their website at Tech Safe Schools and reach out to them and say, here's a list of the administrators in my school. I understand you have a really great packet that you'll send out. So they got funding to have these materials to send out to your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, to their schools and get the conversation going. Because they have three segments of their program. What are the health and safety risks, which we've covered tonight? What are the legal risks? And what we've discovered is Lloyd's of London, Swiss RE, AM Best, all these leading world insurers, guess what they don't cover for? Electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiation. For years, they have known this is a world leading risk and they put exclusions in their policies. So guess who's left holding the bag on liability? Our towns and our schools. So that should be reason enough for our schools to start safeguarding the children. And then the third component of their program, in addition to health risk, legal risk, is of course the solutions. If you go to their website, they have tons of information for how to remediate. And again, it's not rocket science. Run ethernet cables to the devices and turn off the antennas. You can get ethernet switches that have 30 ports in them for an entire classroom. So again, the message is not no technology, but even before the pandemic, we were at epidemic levels of anxiety and depression among adults and our children. We were seeing suicidal ideation in children like we have never seen before. This is a neurotoxin. So we've got to step it up, folks. There's no cavalry coming. So when I was learning about all this, I am over here scratching my head going, cancers, DNA damage, infertility, Alzheimer's, autism, ADD, ADHD. Surely somebody's got our backs on this, right? And then, two years later in 2015, Harvard Law School Center for Ethics came up with this report. It's free, it's online, it's 59 pages, and it's called Captured Agency, how the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. And that's where I lost my innocence, because I thought, surely somebody's got our backs, but no, we have so many captured federal agencies. And I've had the privilege of connecting with Dr. Linda Birnbaum. She retired in recent years as the director of the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. It was her team at the National Institutes of Health that did that national toxicology program that determined clear evidence of cancerous tumors and DNA damage. And she indicates that there are still some really good scientists in our federal government, but we definitely have captured agencies. 
and she says she thinks it's going to have to come up from the local level and the state level before the feds are going to do anything to protect you and I. So that's why I'm so grateful that you all came out just to learn. You know, I told my kids <laughs> when they were little, something's got you freaked out, go over to the couch and scream into the pillow. Get it out of your body. And then come back to the kitchen table and let's sit down and talk about what we can do, right? Because we can do anything if we set our minds to it. So first of all, take control over the devices that you buy. What do you own? Just start doing the gap analysis, right? What's in my bedroom? You want to create a sleep sanctuary above all else or your body is going to hit a tipping point very likely where you're going to have a cascade into all sorts of ailments. The good news is, one of our colleagues up in New Hampshire, Deb Hodgson, she had all these crazy symptoms going on from her blood to her brain to her heart to all this stuff. And her doctors would run their tests and come up empty. She would pay out of pocket thousands of dollars to see a specialist and would come up empty. So Deb, being the right woman she is, she starts doing her own research on all of her symptoms, and that's where she discovers the microwave sicknesses. So she's determined, and one by one, she identified the sources in her home, and she shut them off. And within weeks, her symptoms remediated, and she was able to get off of all sorts of medications. Well, you know, her husband and her kids are doing the thing that most of us tend to do it, and you talk about wireless radiation, it's invisible, but we all have it, so it must be fine. Tinfoil hat, conspiracy theorist, right? That's where most people just naturally tend to go because we don't hear about it in mainstream media because it's owned by the telecom industry. So just about everybody who deals with this deals with that kind of a reaction from somebody or from many people. But you know what convinced Deb's family? Her kids had given her a plant that sat in her kitchen doing nothing for 15 months. Within weeks of removing the wireless at home, that plant shot up. And they're looking at their mom going, whoa, this is crazy. And she's like, hello. <laughs> so that's kind of the way it goes. But, you know, I invite people to be heart-centered with this. There's a crazy lady inside here jumping up and down screaming, we're frying our frickin' kids and our pollinators. But if I let her out, our brain with the amygdala goes into fight, flight, or freeze. So I invite people into the conversation, you know. So let's try to be the kind of person you'd want to play in the sandbox with, right? So we try and stay fact-based. Um, I will send my slides out to anybody who asks, for anybody watching this, um, through your cable station. Just go out to Massachusetts for safe technology. And if you uh, sign on with us, then you'll get on my mailing list and I'll just send you information. Because there's so many great things happening. Um, one of them is, oh, so that captured agency report came out, what, 2015? ProPublica just did another expose, much like captured agency back in November. So there are current resources to share as well. And one of the major gaps we had when I fell down the rabbit hole is that so many people were getting sick and so many people are getting misdiagnosed and we had no way to train our healthcare practitioners. Then in 2019, Dr. Lynn Patrick, in honor of her mentor, Dr. William Ray, out of Texas, um, she pulled together the first EMF, or electromagnetic field medical conference, and brought in world-leading doctors and scientists. I was so honored to be asked to speak on state and local policy. And then in 2021, Elizabeth Kelly put on the next conference. Then the pandemic hit as she was planning that. And it's so great to be in person with everybody and to be at a medical conference because you get these incredible synergies. But in a pandemic, we couldn't do it. So we had to pivot. And poor Libby had to learn how to use a whole online platform, hire a whole different set of people to videotape the lectures. She worked her tail off and it paid off because that medical conference is now accredited for 24.5 continuing medical education credits. 
and she went the extra length to get nurses their CE credits as well. So even your local firefighters have to have continuing education credits. So this is an amazing opportunity. Out of Massachusetts for Safe Technology on our website, we have a letter that you can print out and give to your doctor, your dentist, your therapist, and any other healthcare practitioners you touch. Start where you are. Give them the letter and say, please consider this and quickly. This conference registration, people have to be enrolled by June 15th. They have to complete the training online by July 1st if they want continuing medical education credits. So I encourage everybody to go to Massachusetts for Safe Technology to the events page and print this out. There's also a letter to give to your firefighters, or actually it's not a letter, it's a position statement. Who knew back in 2004 the International Association of Firefighters said we do not consent to cell towers being on or near our properties, and here's why. Out in Santa Barbara, California, they had installed a cell tower out in front of the fire station to blast to a multi-lane highway behind the fire station. And all of a sudden, after weeks of being in this highly polluted, electro-polluted environment, these guys would get an emergency call. They couldn't remember how to properly suit up and get on their engines. Once they got it together and got on the engines, they couldn't remember where they were going in a community that they had serviced for decades. And when they got there, they couldn't remember how to properly administer emergency protocols. And these are our firefighters, the strongest among us. And what have we done? We put this inside our kids' schools. The industry, our government, has plans to put these on all of our school buildings. And if we don't speak up, what's to become of us? So I mentioned our friends Patty and Doug Wood who have tech safe schools. They also have an additional program called Americans for Responsible Technology. We always want to be for the solution, right? They have a whole toolkit for you and I to go out there. Letters that you can print out and give to your neighbors. Letters that you can give to your town. They have a sample zoning code and they have a checklist. How does your local zoning code stack up? Do you have provisions to keep these toxic cell towers out of residential areas? Because if you don't, there's a shot clock and the industry comes in and says, here's our applications. You have 60 days to respond if we're going to put it on an existing pole. If we're going to put up a new pole out in front of somebody's house, you have 90 days to respond. And guess what? That's not enough time to change your zoning code. So if you don't have built-in protections, and the industry's been all over our town saying, oh, gee, you know, this Telecom Act of 1996, it says, sorry, you can't sue us. There's nothing you can do. You have to let us put these cell towers in, which is only partially true. They did write that Telecom Act, the industry, back in 96, but there are many things that every town should have in their zoning code to say, we will allow cell towers to go in an industrial complex or a commercial area, but not into neighborhoods. What they don't tell you is that the only thing in the law that they have to account for within reason is to be able to make a single cell phone call for an emergency. It has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. It has nothing to do with streaming. It has nothing to do with all these added services the industry is making money off. And there's nothing wrong with making money. We all have to do that. But it's high time we learn to do it responsibly. So there are materials at Americans for Responsible Technology to teach us all how to have this conversation with our towns, with our schools, with our doctors, with our loved ones. And they've got it all laid out. So I am so grateful. None of this existed when I fell down the rabbit hole a decade ago. And look where we are today. So I don't know what goes on behind closed doors in Massachusetts politics. I was warned that don't get your hopes up because a bill in Massachusetts never goes anywhere the first time it's introduced. 
and then others would say, CC, if it comes in under a constituent name, good luck to you. There are thousands of bills these guys have to get through every session, and if it's not directly sponsored by a legislator, probably not even going to get a glimpse. So I was like, okay, but I can't think of anything else to do, right? So Senator Spilk introduced a bill for me in 2015, and by this time I had had the privilege of connecting with many of these world-leading scientists and doctors, and far too many people have become harmed. And being a tech writer, I just created a simple template and said, please tell your story. Please share your evidence. And so we got all this stuff in, and lo and behold, my bill, which went to the Public Health Committee, was reported out favorably. But then it went to healthcare financing, and it never went anywhere else. And here we are, eight years later, and it's still never been anywhere. But bless Deb Hodgson up in New Hampshire. There is an award-winning film called Generation Zapped. It's now available on Amazon Prime. You can also get it through many of your library subscription services like Canopy and Hoopla. That's an amazing way to sit down with newbies and say, I just learned something today. You want to come see with me what it is because I'm a little freaked out. Sit down and watch Generation Zapped together. We did a screening up on the North Shore of uh, Massachusetts at a charter school. And Deb had seen the flyer, and she came down from New Hampshire, and it was just so gratifying for her to sit in a room full of people talking about this issue that made her so deathly ill. So Deb brings me up. We do a program like this at her library, and her state rep came and knocked on her door to ask to be reelected. And she'd been trying to reach out to her senator and to her state rep. So Rep. Patrick Agrami comes in. He's an engineer. And he's only been told that you have to have heat from a device before there can be any harm. That's what our engineers and physicists and technologists have all been taught. So he's a good guy. And he starts looking for the science. And he has this major wow moment, like, wow, what are we doing? So he writes a bill. Deb introduces me to him. They get in his car and they drive down from New Hampshire. We sit at my kitchen table in Ashland and we spend the afternoon helping him to connect the dots. And he beefs up his bill and he puts these very poignant questions. Why does that legal fine print even exist in our devices? It says, keep it away from you. Why do the insurance companies not cover for this? Why does our FCC allow 100 times more radiation than certain other countries do? Why does the FCC ignore the non-thermal evidence of harm? And why is nobody looking at the cumulative effect of this radiation that goes out like a pebble in a pond? So you've got a classroom, 20 or 30 kids all radiating each other? Wow. So Rep. Abrami introduced his bill, and some of us were helping him to line up experts I mentioned Frank Clegg from retired from Microsoft Canada. He flew down in his own time and dime and testified with us. Dr. Paul uh, Hero at McGill University, which I understand is like the Harvard of Canada, he used to work for industry. Now he teaches electromagnetism at McGill's medical school, and he has a lab where he has created cancer using electromagnetic fields in his lab. So he came down and testified, and then citizens and biologists. We got that bill through the New Hampshire House Committee on Science, Tech, and Energy over to the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services, and under the governor's pen in seven months. They passed it into law that we have to form a commission to investigate the health and environmental impact of today's wireless technology, and this is their result. They call out the corruption with the FCC and the FDA and the wireless industry. They document it. And then they make 15 recommendations to transition away from hazardous wireless technology to fiber optics or high-speed cable or copper to and through the premises where we simply pick up indoors with wires not rocket science to fix. And now there's a lot of money floating down from federal for their broadband infrastructure. So we need to underscore the need for fiber first, get the close range weight radiation transmitters away from us, and only use wireless as a secondary choice. So this was groundbreaking. 
at the same time as New Hampshire was doing their investigation, Senator Lori Manes Anderson in Oregon was a retired public health nurse, and she got a bill there to require that their Oregon health authority investigate whether it's okay to have wireless in schools. And so they looked to resources at their university, PhD candidates, did the due diligence, came up with a great report. And by the way, their law said non-industry funded studies. Look at the non-industry funded science. So they did, and they gave this report over to the Oregon Health Authority that showed all the harm. And through a Freedom of Information Act request, a journalist by the name of Dan Forbes saw what happened to that draft report. It got redlined. Somebody at OHA crossed out all of the peer-reviewed scientific evidence of harm that this is damaging our children. And at the end of their report that they released, no problem here, keep frying our kids. So we are so very grateful for the integrity of the 10 commissioners, doctors, physicists, engineers, the uh, New Hampshire health authorities. And they also had two seats for the industry at this table. And they were allowed to write a minority report to put inside this majority report. So on pages 18 through 27, they gave us the gift of their plate. You can see exactly what they tell our towns and exactly what they tell our legislators. And then in the very last meeting of the commission, when they introduced their minority report, Senator Denise Rashardi and Dr. Paul Haru brought the facts to bear on that minority report and they tell the truth because the industry tells half-truths and disinformation. It sounds pretty good on the surface. The real facts are also included in the final minutes of this report. So this is just a report. How do we turn their 15 recommendations to protect the environment and our families into action? They need additional laws to do that. And that's where when folks sign up on our email list, when there's an opportunity to lend your voice, to lend your support, building out that public record is critically important. Because if it's in the public record, now you can sue when they don't do their job. That's exactly what happened at the end of 2019. The FCC had a docket open for six years into which they asked for public comment. Scientists, doctors, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, experts from all over the world sent their testimony in, as did far too many people who have lost loved ones or are themselves suffering or their children are suffering. Deb sent in testimony, I sent in testimony, people all over Massachusetts and the world sent in testimony. What did the FCC do? They closed their docket and said, oh no, we don't really need to change those public radiation exposure limits. So once that decision hit something called the Federal Register, then the lawsuits can begin. The Environmental Health Trust, which is an amazing repository, probably the world's biggest database on all of this, they sued Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s Children's Health Defense. He's been out there defending our children from environmental toxins for 50 years. They sued, and a number of people around the country. It was all combined into one lawsuit. And at the end of the day, those judges in the Ninth Circuit Court in Washington, D.C., were presented with 11,000 pages of evidence in the public record showing how harmful this is. 27 volumes in print that they were handed. And so these judges came back to the FCC and said, well, show us your homework. How did you determine that you want to stand by these 1996 public radiation exposure limits before we had anything like what we're radiating ourselves with today? And the attorneys for the FCC went, well, the FDA said it was okay. So the judges said, show us the homework from the FDA. And there is none. Not one of our federal agencies has done a comprehensive review on the scientific literature. We have a huge regulatory gap. So the people who sued won. 
the court, it was actually on Friday the 13th of August, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, on Friday the 13th, but it was in 2021. They remanded or sent it back to the FCC saying, you need to do better. You need to account for vulnerabilities to children, for infertility, for neurotoxicity, to environmental impacts. And they have not done one thing since then. So it's not going to happen from the top. There is no knight in shining armor coming. But you and I have so many amazing resources to do what we can from where we are. Start with where you are. What have you done for your life's work? Who are the people that you know who you think would want to know about this? Invite them to come to our monthly free public education webinars. That little blue bordered one on the bulletin board, if you happen to have a phone and you do a QR code, that will take you right to our events page where you can register. Bring as many people as you can. Um, one of my local heroes is this woman named Peggy in my town. We bump into each other at our local farmer's market and she's got a very curious mind and she, she can smell the big tobacco playbook when you start piecing this together. So we keep bumping into each other. She'll ask me questions and she just got this Safe and Sound Pro 2 meter. This is the meter that was recommended at the medical conference. So now doctors are putting these into their practices. There's a doctor up on the North Shore who loans it to her patients for 10 bucks and says you've got two hours. Go home, walk all around your house and come back and tell me what you found. And we'll teach you how to fix it. So Peggy got one of these and she said, oh, I thought I had it all fixed in my house and then I got the meter and then I realized my rate you know, radiation was still coming out of my router because there were multiple antennas in there that she didn't know about. But now she has the evidence. She called up Verizon or Comcast, looped in with me and figured out what all those antennas are and how to turn them off. And so she says, now I take this everywhere I go. She's like a kid in a candy store because until you can see the invisible, how do we know what we're up against? And, yep, you've got yours. I think that's the ED88T. Cornet. Cornet, yep. And Deb's got her Safe and Sound Pro 2. The irony is when they sent us the stimulus money during COVID, mm -hmm. this is what I bought. Ah. Uh, I'm not going to spend it on bills. This is what I get. Well, that's a lifeline for you because you get sick around magnetic radiation. So good for you. you remember what you taught me about the Comcast? Yes, so on the Comcast routers, and I learned this when I went down to a disability hearing in Rhode Island. So when we first got into this and I stopped circling my tail and, and I hardwired my whole house, I knew that that triple plate box in my utility closet from Comcast was still radiating because I could measure it. Um, or no, I had Verizon at the time. So I called up Verizon, I said, how do I, I'm choosing to hardwire, I want better service and hardwiring knocks the socks off of anything wireless. So he said, oh, that's easy, just sit down at your computer. And I'm like, really? Because my box is in the basement. And he said, yeah, sit down at your computer. And he walked me through how to get into my account online. So through the wires, I could go into my account, go into wireless settings, and lo and behold, there was a 2.4 gigahertz antenna and a five gigahertz antenna that just sat there radiating through my floors, walls, so, you know, the whole house. So all I had to do was go off, off, apply. And it says, you realize you're cutting off everyone's Wi-Fi? Mm, thank you very much. And I waited a minute or two for it to dissipate and I took my meter back down to my basement and guess what? Radio silence. It was a beautiful thing. Well, then my husband, Steve, sees a better deal with Comcast. And I had heard about Comcast. And so he says, so we'd like to have you come switch the service over, but my wife's gonna wanna be really, really, really sure that it's not radiating. And they said, no problem, we can take care of that. So the guy spends the morning switching out the boxes around our house. And um, I said, okay, humor me. And I go truck it down there with my little meter and I turn it on and it's in the red zone. And I said, so you got the 2.4 and the five gigahertz antenna shut off in that router, right? He goes, yeah. And I said, and I also learned that Comcast Xfinity has put public hotspots inside my house to throw signal out to the curb so your customers using my electricity can maintain connection as they drive around. 
I said, did you turn off the 2.5 and the 5 gigahertz hotspot? He said, no, I did. I said, so why is that still radiating? He said, I don't know. And he called his help desk. They didn't know. He called his supervisor. He didn't know. And he said, well, I'm going to come back tomorrow with my supervisor. And I said, OK. That night, I reached out to a colleague in Silicon Valley. When I was at that first medical conference out in California, I sat at lunch with Jeremy Johnson and Peter Sullivan. And I remember them talking about a fifth antenna. So I reached out to Peter, and I said, what was that fifth antenna? He said, oh, home security. Whether you have a wireless home security system or not, this comes primed to hook you up, and it's radiating. So Peter said, but their frontline help desk doesn't know. You have to ask for a tier two tech support person, which gets you to an engineer who, from his end of things, can disable that antenna. And I went, whoa, homie, don't play that game. Because we know they do updates in the night, and I don't want that by chance turned on and radiating my family again. So my husband was very sweet. He went down to the electronic store, Best Buy or something at the time, and he picked up our own router and that had a button on it that I could press to turn off and on the wireless if I had somebody in my house who really wanted a wireless connection person. So when those guys showed up, the technician and his supervisor the next day, I said, look guys, I solved the puzzle. It's a home security antenna. And they went, wow, really? And I said, yeah, so how about as a show of good faith, you just hook up my router for me. He said, no problem. They were great. So there are solutions for everything, but you really have to measure. Because if we don't measure, we can't know. And with the Internet of Things, they want to put a 5G antenna in every electronic device that you buy. Have you seen the iPotty? <laughs> so when your little sweet pumpkin's there on the potty seat, you can put a tablet right there and radiate your child while they're trying to do their business. Have you seen the little device they stick on a baby's diaper to radiate their organs so that you, mom and dad, don't have to do the sniff test anymore? It will send you a signal if your baby signal and it soils itself or herself to your cell phone. Steve, oh gosh, we had a 27-year-old stove that was really on its last leg. And so he found a floor model, a really good deal, it arrives, I look at the thing, and it says smart range on it. That and my, your husband. <laughs> yeah, I know, poor Steve. So, smart range. And my, oh, my girlfriend had bought one when she built a new house, and we could go right into the settings and disable the radiation. Why would anyone need a smart stove so you can turn it off and on when you're not home? Whatever suits your fancy, I would do it. Um, I wouldn't want to heat up my stove if I'm not there. But anyway, that's a personal choice. You should just have a right to know. So I go to my settings, and there's nothing in there that allows me to turn that off. So I pull out the manual, and I find the RF exposure section, radio frequency radiation, and it says, keep at least 20 centimeters distance from this device. <laughs> So okay, here's my stove, and here's me in the middle of my kitchen <laughs> trying to flip some. That's not going to work. So I called their tech support. They sent a technician out, and I pulled out my meter, and I said, usually my home on this meter is under 10 microwatts per square meter. That range is 1,090,000. And I don't want to cook anything in my kitchen, but my so he was pretty grumpy with me. He didn't want to know any of this. And, I, and he had a cell phone there, and it sent the thing off. And so I said, um, so that's what you're saying. He says, fine, I'll take it out to my truck. And he leaves, and he goes and he sits in his truck and waits for his engineer to call him back. His engineer calls him back. All he had to do was remove the back of the stove. Behind the digital display is the motherboard. Right next to that was this little teeny tiny board that he just went, and that unplugged the radio frequency antenna. And then we measured back down under 10 in my house. So this internet of things, same thing happened with our TV. We had to take that back and find one that we could at least hardwire with an ethernet cable. Um, so 
with the Internet of Things, we just need to know what these exposures are. So this device that was recommended at the medical conference is just shy of $400. Um, and when I was first figuring this out, I thought, in my town, when they started replacing the incandescent light bulbs with those swirly CFLs, which, by the way, throw off a really dangerous form of man-made electromagnetic radiation, um, the industry put a kilowatt meter on loan in our libraries that was in a case and barcoded, and you could take it home and measure your kilowatt consumption on an incandescent bulb versus these new CFLs and look and see how much money you'll save over the year, right? So I thought, why don't we get one for our library that measures radio frequency? It took me three grant cycles with my town. We have a pot of money that citizens can apply for grants that benefit the community and I had to educate every one of our select board members one by one and then well, first I submitted, they're like, well, you don't really know what this is, so they denied my grant application. Second time around, they said, um, this is probably a Board of Health issue. Well, I had already met with our health agent, and he knew back in the 90s, he got wined and dined by industry when they were putting the first cell towers in. He didn't know about Wi-Fi, but he knew that the law prohibited him, or so he thought. There were actually many things we can write in our own zoning code to keep ourselves distanced from these toxic exposures. So anyway, it took me three tries. I had to educate every one of our select board members one by one, and then they gave me funding to put one on loan in our library, conditional upon the library trustees accepting it into their circulation. So I had to present to them too, and by the end of the night, they voted four to one, because they are the conduit of information in the community. And so we became the first in the United States to put one on loan in our public library. And then at the medical conference in California, we flew all the way out to California to meet a doctor out there who was from Newton, Massachusetts. So Dr. Judy Safrier and I went after one from the Cultural Council that's a state level grant that apportions money to every town. And so we got it through the Newton Cultural Council grant fund. And we did a screening of Generation Zapped with the library and put one of the devices on loan. And then now out in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, I don't know if you guys have seen it in the Berkshire Eagle or any of the other news outlets around this area, but Verizon put a cell tower up on top of this neighborhood called Shack Town. Um, Kirsten, there's a utility closet right there. You might want to come sit closer up here where you'll have some distance. And a shout out to Kirsten Beatty of Last Tree Laws. She has been working on this issue longer than I have. She has introduced many bills to try and get our legislators' attention to this. So Kirsten, hats off for you for everything you've done over the years. Um, so. Cece, I would just like to yes. say, as long as I've been in South Hadley, you know this, because I did it for one of our community members here in Northampton. If anyone's within driving distance, I'd be happy to come to your house if you don't have your one meter. So far, this library doesn't have one to lend. I'll come and do some measurements. Deb, thank so, you so much. So I don't know if the give you my contact yeah, I don't know if the recording picked that up, but um, Deb Chandler lives locally and she so has far. purchased per, yeah, she may be moving. She's <laughs> purchased one of these meters <laughs> and is offering to come by your house and do a walkthrough. So um, we're very grateful to our local cable stations. They came to my home. We did a walkthrough and created a 23-minute public service announcement that's out on my uh, YouTube page. 10,000 people have already watched that. So how cool that that 23-minute PSA has helped 10,000 people come into the fold and maybe make choices. We just did a walkthrough, showed common exposures and suggestions for how to remove so out in Pittsfield, Verizon puts the cell tower on top of this neighborhood, and the day that it was turned on, right as everyone got sent home for the pandemic, where you're trapped inside your house now for 24 hours a day, this little girl comes downstairs and says, Mommy, my head feels all buzzy inside, and I've got a headache, and, and they had seen the trucks coming in, breaking through their neighborhood, going into the woods behind their house on a 68, 59, 60 acre parcel of land 
that they got a tower permit for the front of the property in the commercial district. And they had the audacity to break through this neighborhood, to break through police tape, and put that cell tower in on top of this neighborhood and tell these people they are the cost of doing business. So Adam Pittsfield, their library, put one of these into circulation. Anybody who's part of that library system from other towns can take it out as well. Um, and they have been working tirelessly with their town. It wasn't just Courtney Gillardi and both of her daughters who became ill. The girls were vomiting in their beds. They were having all the skin conditions. Neighbors had the headaches, the nosebleeds, the tinnitus. Cancers that had resolved came back. One is now dead. They've been fighting this for three years. It was so toxic, they've had to abandon their homes. We still have people sleeping in their cars. And for the first time in the United States, Pittsfield's city council said to their board of health, investigate this. Their board of health spent 15 months speaking to doctors who have given diagnoses of electromagnetic illness speaking to scientists, speaking to engineers, speaking to physicists, and they came up with an emergency order to Verizon to say, come to the table and tell us why we shouldn't issue a cease and desist order. Let's come figure this out. There was a property owner in a commercial district in Pittsfield who said, we're, we're happy to have the cell tower on our land. Take it out of that neighborhood. And Verizon wouldn't do it. What did Verizon do? There were seven days for them to come to the table. Five o'clock on the seventh day, they go to the courts and put an injunction against the Pittsfield Board of Health's emergency order. They said, we don't think that's legal. Well, the Board of Health had done their due diligence. They had consulted with the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards and talked to attorneys that say, Health boards have the ultimate authority for protecting their citizens. They trump the Telecom Act. <laughs> but their city council and Mayor Tyre would not give their own Board of Health the funding to take this to court. There's a lot of dirty politics involved in this. There are some very good public servants, but there are also dirty politics. And so now there's a civil suit against the entire town of Pittsfield, Mayor Tyre, the City Council, the Board of Health, for not doing their due diligence. And we are praying that on April 6, that the Massachusetts courts will find in favor of these citizens and let them go back to their homes and turn that cell tower off. So we're actually going to do a prayer circle on Zoom. I think it'll be on the 4th, probably about 8 o'clock. Wednesday is the court case. Monday, I think we're going to do the prayer circle. So if you get on my list, just come and give your good energy because we need to lift these folks up. They have been working so hard. Um, and we just want these kids and their families to go home. Okay. So I'll close on another word of encouragement. The first medical school textbook has just been issued in the last couple of months. This is an amazing resource. It's got all the science in it. It's got scientists from all over the world, medical doctors, and this is now available to put it into the curriculum in our medical schools. The Environmental Nurses Organization has put a chapter in their version two of their Environmental Nursing Handbook. So, Sure, this is called Electromagnetic Fields of Wireless Communications, Biological and Health Effects by Dr. Dimitri Panagopoulos out of Athens, Greece. Dr. Anthony Miller has written one of the chapters in here. He has been a senior advisor to the World Health Organization, so highly credible. And we have everything we need to get to safe technology, but nobody can do it but us. So, like I said to my kids, go home and scream into a pillow, get it out of your system, and then one by one, do your own gap analysis. What can you do differently today? If you have a wearable, it can still track you and do all that stuff, you know, your steps or whatever. 
but put it in airplane mode, right? If you go out to the Fitbit, <laughs> if you go to the Fitbit community website, you'll see these strapping elite athletes who get on and say, God, my heart, my heart was going jiggity. And then my Fitbit broke, and I didn't have it for a couple weeks. And then I got my second Fitbit, and I was fine until I put that second Fitbit back on, and then my heart started going jiggity again. So be very careful with what you expose yourself to. Learn to use it safely. As a first step, choose airplane mode. If you have to have something active, turn off all the antennas but the one you need and set it as far away from you as you can. Forward cell phone calls to your landline and turn off the antennas in your phone and create a sleep sanctuary. Okay, give your body the benefit. Deb. Can I add a few tips? Absolutely, come on up. Well, that's okay. I'll okay. talk from here as long as Dorothy's recording can hear me. So, I was taught that if you have a Google account and you're using Google Maps for your GPS, you can download maps and, and you need the signal to do that. but you can use them offline mm -hmm. while you're navigating. It's not going to show you the current traffic conditions, but most of the time, you know, I don't need that. So I have, for me, I have the three states, Mass, New Hampshire, Vermont. You can download whichever ones you need. The other thing is that when you're in the car and you do have the phone on, if you at least roll the windows down, even if you need to pull over and use the phone real quick, roll the windows down, and then your car is not acting like a Faraday cage while you're using. I get sick enough that I can't even have this in airplane mode for very long in the car with the windows up. I gotta shut it off altogether, but if I do need it, I pull over and I roll the windows down. Oh, that's an excellent tip, yeah. Um, apparently it uses some sort of a satellite triangulation system that was, it's just a one-way signal to track you to where you're going. So like Deb said, once you, download your nav, download your map, then put your phone in airplane mode and it will still navigate you to where you need to go. If you take a wrong turn, you might need to pull over and It does get confused every once in a while, so yeah. you reroute it, then I'll turn it on for a second. And then yeah, and I'm old school. Yeah. Sometimes I print out my directions if I'm going I someplace do. new. Yeah, I do have yeah. yeah. and if it's a business trip, then I have to print it out for my tax purposes anyway, so I hate killing the trees, but sometimes just have to choose the lesser of two evils. Other questions or comments? Yes? Um, what about the uh, power lines overhead? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they have much stronger magnetic fields if you happen to live near them. So yes, that's an excellent question. He's asking about the power lines overhead, and those are another form of man-made electromagnetic fields. Um, Right now, the Centers for Disease Control has something called the ALARA principle, and ALARA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. So with any man-made energy, we want to use the three tenets of the ALARA principle. Create as much distance as you can. Spend as little time near these emissions as you can. So you don't want to live under power. Um, but there are other types of meters that will measure those electric and magnetic fields. Um, I know the Coronet meter that you have is a consumer model for about 200 maybe just under $200. You can set that to do the radio frequency. You can also set it to do electric and magnetic fields. So keep as much distance as you can. Spend as little time as you can. And if you can't, then shield. And there are companies out there, uh, for example, the company that makes Safe Living Technologies, they make this meter. They also have shielding fabrics and other things like paints that have metallics in it that can create a barrier. But you've got to be really careful if you do shielding because if you don't measure and make sure there's no signal in there, you're going to lock yourself into a Faraday cage where that signal is going to bounce off the metal and whammy you time and again. So it's very important to really know your stuff or hire somebody, perhaps, uh, there's a profession called building biologists, and a certified building biologist has gone through very rigorous training for environmental pollutants, mold, formaldehyde, VOCs, you know, all of that, the water. And if they've gotten the higher level of credentials, they can also come into your house do a report to show you where all your man-made exposures are from electromagnetic fields. So 
lots of great resources. That's an excellent question. Stay away from the high voltage power lines. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, I just add that there is that book by Sam Milham called Dirty Electricity. That's quite quite a good book to look at for in terms of electricity. Uh, but I did have a question, and the question was um, that um, as you're going across the state and you're talking with people and you're trying to communicate to various communities, so are you finding um, that there are strongholds where there's a lot of support and then areas where there isn't support? Like, how would you assess support on this issue? across the state and where, like Pittsfield might be a place where there's a lot of attention right now, or Sheffield. I, I oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful you asked that, Kirsten, because there's a lot happening in Massachusetts right now. We talked about Shacktown in Pittsfield. That's the name of that neighborhood. Courtney Gillardi has been the champion on this issue. They had to leave their home because everybody was getting so sick. All they could afford to move into was this old abandoned little tiny shack home in Lenox that literally had rodent whatever all over it. It hadn't been lived in in 10 years, but that was better than living under a cell tower. So they are also in Lenox, and in Lenox, Verizon went over to the Curtis, which is the state-owned building. It used to be an old fancy hotel. And now it's their senior citizen housing and disabled housing. And Verizon wants to put cell tower antennas on the roof. So uh, there are some really good people there who've been working with their town. We did a rally there on the steps of the Curtis on a day when there was an arts and crafts festival right next door. Lots of foot traffic, passed a lot of stuff out. People were showing up at their uh, municipal meetings and saying no this has no business being close range and they stopped it they stopped it twice it was put on you know an application was submitted you know a decade or two ago they stopped it then and they stopped it now and now there's an industry guy by the name of De David Maxson of Isotrope who's in there so graciously offering to rewrite their zoning bylaws and he of course is writing them to make it easy to put small cells right outside people's homes. And he is stripping out the protections that they did have in their zoning bylaw. So there's a really good group of people who have already stopped it on their town warrant once, and they're slated to do it again the first week of May. So if you know anybody in Lenox, please ask them to go to town meeting and do not allow that industry bylaw to be passed. Over in Sheffield and Great Barrington, they're trying a new approach, and that is through a citizen's petition. I think by state law in Massachusetts, if you can get 10 registered voters in your town, get more than 10, because some people don't realize maybe they're not properly registered, so gun for at least 30 people to sign your petition. But remember that lawsuit where the FCC got sued and the court said, hmm, you need to go back to the drawing board and look at the science? They've never done it. So what Sheffield and Great Barrington are trying is to say, we, the citizens of our town, are taking a vote to say that we want to put language into our zoning bylaw that until the FCC does its court-mandated work, we do not want to have any of these close-range antennas in our town. So they're doing that there. They have inspired um, Upton, and there's a citizen in Upton who is following suit. Um, I just heard from a woman in another town whose name escapes me at the moment. And then there's Patricia Burke out in Millis, Massachusetts, who is following a lead in Pittsfield. So the Pittsfield City Council they're like, we don't know what to do about this issue. There's nothing for us to turn to. So they wrote letters to their state legislators. They wrote letters to their federal delegates. They wrote letters to the Massachusetts Municipal Association and the, um, the group of mayors as well, saying, we need somebody to tell us what we're supposed to be doing here. 
So Patricia Burke has something on her town warrant that says until the FCC does what they're supposed to be doing, we want our town to at least send letters off like Pittsfield did. So this is new this year. This is new this spring, and we're very excited to see how this goes. We don't know if the industry is going to start suing again. We don't know, but if we don't try, who's going to help us? What was it that the city of Burlington, Mass, did? Great. So a few years back, uh, I think started probably in 2017 into 2018, there was a townwide commission committee formed to assess small cells. So they brought in a member from their health board, from their zoning, from their planning, from all their town committees, and they set up this special committee. And at the end of the day, Verizon submitted seven small cell applications and what they put in their policy was that anything you put up has to comply with ADA. So you can't stick one of these small cells in the middle of the sidewalk because a wheelchair has to be able to go by. Anything that you put in has to blend in with the environment because under federal law you can do stuff with aesthetics. So it has to blend in with the environment and the Verizon attorney said, well, some of our equipment can be painted, some of it can't. So that was kind of cool. But then what Burlington did is said, Essentially, you just can't come in and drop and run. You can't just put this equipment in and never come back again. If we grant you a permit for those applications, you have to come back every single year and do an independent certification that that equipment is still viable under current law. And we as a town don't have that expertise, so we are going to charge you to have every one of those small cells recertified through an independent consultant. And the night they ratified that policy, the Verizon attorney said, well, we don't want to set precedent for an annual research or a fee, because mind you, they're planning to put millions of these in all over our country, and they don't want to cut into their bottom line. So that's how Burlington took care of it. And they put preferential areas in their policy, industrial, commercial, stay away from the residential and the schools and stuff like that. So yeah, there are some really good things. And then our friends at Americans for Responsible Technology took that Burlington ordinance and best practices from around the country. And that's how they built out their sample code that it's just sitting there. You guys can print it out and take it to your town, take it to your town attorney, because most of our town attorneys are wonderful litigate or wonderful attorneys, but they are not experts in telecom law. They too have probably only heard what the industry's been spinning. There are amazing attorneys out there who do this day in and day out. Somebody like Andrew Campanelli can be hired by a town for less than $9,000 to look at your current zoning code, look at your state law, fill in the gaps and tell you exactly what you can put in your zoning. $9,000 is a drop in the hat for a town budget to do what this is going to put in for protection. So, Tomorrow yeah. Tomorrow night is the webinar online. Is that Americans yes. for yeah, citizens' rights relating mm -hmm. to wireless tech? So thank you, Deb. Tomorrow night, actually tomorrow from 4 to 5.30 Eastern Time, our friends at Americans for Responsible Technology are partnering with four of the country's leading attorneys, and they are doing a public service webinar to teach you and I and our towns what rights they do have and how to fix this. So if you go to Americans for Responsible Technology, you will find it there. If you go to my website, Massachusetts for Safe Technology, and you go to our news page, the first link that's on there is to our newsletter or our communiques. And I just sent something out today that has the links for that as well. Great, great questions, folks. Other thoughts? Comments. I like. Oh, go ahead. No, you go. We'll come back to you, Dorothy. Okay. Um, yeah. So I wanted to say that I I use a way of remediating EMFs mm -hmm. and when you travel, mm -hmm. and it's something called focused life force energy. Okay. And it's a quantum wave that you subscribe to, and it costs about a dollar a day. And it includes all kinds of stuff. 
but it's scientifically backed and research and there's um, it's it's out of Nelson, British Columbia. There's two guys who run the run the whole thing. One of them's an engineer, and um, I really noticed the, the difference. And you can um, you can put put the amount of you can change the frequency yourself, you know, anytime on, on their website. And um, yeah, I, I, and it includes much more, like hydration and help for digestion. Yeah, just that's excellent. And you know, we, we created this problem, so we should be able to fix it. And it's so exciting to hear through quantum physics and other <coughs> avenues where people are doing the research. Most of our funding got cut here in the United States back in the 1990s when they brought this telecom act forward. So um, there are new technologies being developed, hopefully ones that, as you say, are helpful. Um, sometimes what we recommend, you know, people always ask about the pendants or the stickers you can put on your phone. Something that might support one person's biology could be toxic to another. So don't take anybody's word for anything. Learn for yourself. Um, some will recommend muscle testing and get your own biofeedback on something. So if it shorts you out, that's probably a sign that that is not a good product for you. So. Um, maybe go to an energy healer and test things out. Um, and then when you find something that's good, by all means, share it. Okay, Dorothy. I just want to suggest that if you'd like Forbes to get a meter, give them a call. Mm -hmm. Because the more people that ask, the more likely we are to get one. Yeah, so Dorothy was just saying that if you live in Northampton or wherever you live, call your local public library and say, we understand that most libraries have a, a collection of things today, a library of things, and other libraries are putting radio frequency detection meters on loan. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me through Massachusetts for Safe Technology, I can send you the paperwork that we did to get it on loan and how they loan it out. Um, the Newton Library had one too, um, Pittsfield, Ashland. So, so yeah. Pittsfield is in our Western, the um, CW Mars network. So we could borrow mm -hmm. Pittsfield you can. as part of this network, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately, the one in Ashland was done through town funding uh, from that grant program, so it's only available to people in Ashland. But I did speak to the librarian in, in uh, Pittsfield, and they said, yeah, anybody on their network can take it out. So. Other questions or comments? Um, for those who joined late, if you want to sign in on that sheet, I will send out my slides, and then you can just drill down to whatever interests you and learn the facts for yourself. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you guys so much for joining us, and thank you again to Dorothy and to Deb and to Forrest for, and the others who behind the scenes worked on this. We understand that the cable station loaned equipment to Dorothy, and so hopefully they will edit this and put it up online so that everybody can watch it in the community. Just yeah. another comment. I know I'm making a lot, but just as far as the legislation and the legislative process, mm -hmm. prior to meeting you and having the opportunity to testify at the state houses, I wasn't someone who even understood the legislative process. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say, if, if it's at all feasible and you get on CC's mailing list, she'll tell you when there are opportunities to testify or to submit testimony. And it is an important part of the process. Yeah, you get to sit in front of the lobbyists who then get up and lie their butts off, but you get to see how it all works, and, and we are making headway. Yeah, and I too. Never in a million years did I imagine this is where my time would be. Yeah. <coughs> I knew very little about the legislative process. I was just a happy mom, tech writer, doing my thing, and then I fell down the rabbit hole. So we're all learning as we go, and if anything that I've learned, you know, I, I just, I don't call myself an expert, but I got a pretty good head start on most people. And I'll tell you, the real experts in this, the doctors, the scientists, the sick people, they are so wanting to help every single one of us come up to snuff on this and do everything we can and stand shoulder to shoulder and, and work peacefully with our towns and our legislators. So if I can help you in your community, 
Communication's my happy place, so bring me in, let me know what I can do, come to our free webinars every month, come back 12 times and ask more questions, you know. Kirsten. I'd just like to say that I've noticed that there's really, there's a ton of people who don't know anything, and it is important to have that publicity, and that um, the other issue is that the people in the office they will tell you they agree with you and they're very sweet, but they're not doing anything as far as I can tell. Like, yeah. There's nothing that goes. So really what we need is a lot of publicity. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of attention on the issue. Yeah. So Kirsten is indicating that we need a lot of publicity around this issue, that you know our legislators will tell you they understand, but they're not moving any of these bills into law. We've gotten them out of the first committee before, but we've gotten nothing in Massachusetts executed into law, so it comes back to us to make the invisible visible. So perhaps one thing you guys could do is write a letter to the editor of your local papers and say, hey, there was this amazing forum at the library. I didn't know any of this stuff. We should all be learning about it because we're all caught up in this electro smog and we can learn to have excellent technology without frying ourselves. And you can go learn at this free public education webinar twice a month. We do one at noontime and we do one in the evenings to try and accommodate schedules. So, yeah, start where you are. What can you do? Can you bring me into your children's schools? Can you bring me into your professional organizations? Um, I love doing this because if we can plant one seed every day, that's a great day. If we get really good things like a textbook or a medical conference or a commission report by a legislative body, then we can pop the champagne for that day, and then we get up the next day and keep going. All right. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you, everybody. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.